Before we get into the episode, a quick reminder that The Last Trade is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing should be construed as investment or legal advice. Now for a word from OnRamp. OnRamp is a Bitcoin asset management platform built on multi-institution custody. We serve high net worth individuals, institutional investors, and financial intermediaries with the best-in-class suite of products, which include multi-institution custody, a spot Bitcoin fund, on-ramp wealth for RIAs, and private wealth services for high net worth individuals. Leveraging our partnership with BitGo and other industry leaders, OnRamp's multi-institution custody is a first-of-its-kind institutional-grade vault, requiring two of three institutions at any point in time to sign once a client's unique permissions have been met. Our multi-institution vaults utilize cold storage key signing and authentication at the direction of the client to maximize security for client assets. This pioneering approach to custody is the foundation of OnRamp's financial products, which reduce counterparty risk associated with trusting a single institution. To learn more about how OnRamp can help you secure a new or existing Bitcoin position, please visit our website at onrampbitcoin.com, where you can schedule a consultation and connect directly with our team. What you're telling me is that music is about to stop, and we're going to be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of darkness. 1974, 1987, 92, 97, 2000, and whatever we want to call this. It's all just the same thing over and over. We can't help ourselves. I say when we sell. Hey, 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 side hey, hey I so say when we sell. Gentlemen. Back for another episode of The Last Trade. How are we doing this week? We're good. We got like a, somebody fat fingered the ETF approval. That's a good engagement hack. I'm thinking about doing it from the TFTC account. Bitcoin ETF officially <laughs> approved. I'm not going to delete the tweet though. Or what what was the- a lot of attention. <laughs> not, not all the best kind of attention though. Yeah. People should have known Cointelegraph breaking the ETF news is not likely. It'll probably be Reuters or somebody like that. Yeah. And the, apparently where it got sourced from was some random telegram chat, uh, you know, fake breaking news announcement. And then, and then they just like copied that and ran with it as if it was some real source. I mean, you know, the best information is on those CD telegram groups. Yeah. That's where, that's where Larry thinks going to drop the news that the ETF was approved. <laughs> Um, but alas, we're joined by Mitch Kochman this week, the director of platform sales at BitGo. Really excited for this one, Mitch, because BitGo, I mean, outside of Coinbase, it's probably the only reputable company that's been around for a decade in the Bitcoin space. Mike Belshi, founder and CEO, uh, really popularized multi-sig and have built your whole company around multi-sig security and obviously we're here because the on-ramp bitco relationship has matured to a point where you guys are doing some really cool stuff i'm sure we'll touch on that but before we get into that uh michael and and jesse have told me that you're the bitcoiner within bitco so what is your backstory how did you find bitcoin and how did you end up at bitco absolutely yeah president maxi but uh so came into the, or found Bitcoin 2017. Uh, my dad actually worked in crypto VC for a little bit. Um, and really first introduction to it was price goes up and, uh, you know, was really all it was for 2017 in that bull run. Uh, 2018, 19 started really falling down the rabbit hole. Um, I'd say, you know, first I came from IBM, spent 11 years over there. The technology grabbed me first. Then really, it was the the cypherpunk ethos, the libertarian you know ethos that surrounds it that we all sort of get engaged into. Um, punk rock was a uh, important, formidable part of my uh, my childhood, and I think that sort of laid the foundation for for some of those ideals. Really struck a chord in me. Um, so 2020 rolled around. I was on a uh, sabbatical from IBM. I was in Argentina, and I, I saw the impact that inflation actually had on the people there. And, you know, I think it was a, it was a bartender that I was talking to that 
talking about the efforts that he had to go through to um, to buy the bar that we were sitting at and had to go, you know, black market to get currency exchange to, uh, you know, Argentina peso to the U.S. dollar to keep, uh, you know, the amount in escrow uh, as they were waiting for, you know, closing on the uh, on the property. And how he had a backpack with all his money and because, you know, the fees of going through a bank uh, for, for that currency exchange were, were outrageous, um, could have been robbed, you know, outside both times that, that he made the exchanges. Um, and it really kind of had that, you know, check your financial privilege, Bitcoin fixes this moment of we can actually really make a difference here. Um, in that moment, sort of thought perhaps this is this is where I should be working. Uh, ended up coming back early from that trip and uh, you know, there was a pandemic and, um, you know, came back to IBM and sort of fell into what ended up being like, had had been my dream job over there. I was you know, global client exec for, for JP Morgan. Um, it was an incredible job. Um, got so much exposure to you know, scale and you know, traditional finance that uh, you know, the, the infrastructure that, that powers you know, a bank like JP Morgan is pretty, pretty insane uh, when you talk about raw compute power. Um, but I had, you know, it was actually, it was one day I was, uh, I was taking Fridays as paternity leave and um, I looked at my son, uh, it was day of the Bitcoin, or it must have been a Thursday, the day of the Bitcoin conference. Um, and I, I looked at my son after, you know, watching the whole day of the conference and I kind of had this moment where I wanted to, him to be proud of the work I was doing. And, you know, I was inspired by the conference and, you know, making, you know, JP Morgan more efficient and, you know, saving people resources was not exactly, um, what I have in mind for for how I, I want him to view the work that I'm doing. Um, so that day I made the decision to go work in the industry. And, uh, you know, after a bit, here I am. That's powerful. It is for the kids. It's become <laughs> somewhat of a meme, but I have very similar moments with my boys when I'm looking at them and looking out at the world that they're completely oblivious to. It's like, what can we be doing to, to ensure that they don't have to deal with the madness that we all have had to deal with at least me 32 years into my life. It's been pretty chaotic first three decades of my life. Sure. Michael, you're on mute. Yikes. Rookie mistake. Uh, Mitch and I have had a lot of conversations. I didn't know that about his uh, journey, but also or more importantly about kind of, you know, looking at your son and having this decision. Cause I think uh, to Marty's point, we don't know like how this ends up. We don't know the other side, but you want to be able to look back and at least, or somebody look back and say like, at least they tried, at least they were doing something in the best use of the time. And so, yeah, I mean, we had Larry Lapard on last week and he's another kind of, you know, kindred spirit that I think we get along with everybody on this group or on this call. And um, it's the same thing. Like he just never took the easy way out. It wasn't the, the, the thing that his peers did but he was still there and he saw the other side and he's going to be able to always keep his head up with his children. And so that, that's a, it's a cool story to hear that your son was the, you know, kind of forcing function to get you to, to contribute. And you're definitely contributing. I'd say son and my, my wife pushing me to uh, actually, you know, follow the dream. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah. We can't, we can't forget the wives. Exactly. I think everybody. I love you, you baby. <laughs> yeah, I know how hard everybody on this call works, and it wouldn't be possible without having a significant other that that was understanding. Oh yeah, very true. Yeah, Mitch, I, I keep thinking about you know the the thing that that always bounces around in my head is that that we are a part of some next wave of the like the American Revolution, the Enlightenment, you know, something like that in terms of advancing, uh, asserting and advancing human freedom. Um, and you know the right to money and free money, money that is not controlled by anyone, and that is just so important. It, 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 there's no higher calling when you put it in that kind of you know uh, historical context. And and then I also think about like there's there's a beautiful poem um, most people are familiar with, the Ozymandias or however it's pronounced, um, where you know some great king in the desert has erected monuments to himself, uh, but they're viewed as crumbled ruins in, the, in you know, many years later. And you know, look on my works in despair is the, the, the quote um, carved into 
some crumbled pillar. Uh, I am I, I am Ozymandias, look at my works in despair, something like that. And and that to me is like what we spend, what most people spend so much of their time doing in corporate America. You know, you're you're building something that is you know a few years after you depart, your your efforts there amount to crumbled ruins. They're, they they fall into disuse, or you know they're papered over by some other improvements or updates, and and it's like you were never there. But by working in Bitcoin, you're part of something that's like a lasting um, human uh, movement for liberty that, that it just, it's just night and day. And so that, those are the things that have been motivating me as well of, um, you know, the, the calling of it is just a, 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 just a different level entirely. And I, I truly think, you know, that way I get to work with companies across the industry, like anyone who is still here, you know, they're working because they have that calling, they've got that edge, you know, it's sort of that, you know, the, all the liberty and American revolution things that you're speaking of, it's, it's what drives us. And, you know, those who, uh, you know, who are still here are, are definitely fueled by that. Yeah, it pays to stay during the bear markets. I've been in this for 10 years now, six years professionally. And that's when you really find out who's who's in it for the cause who's uh, in it for number go up and who's in it for the revolution. The, the like part of the revolution is number go up. You just got to learn how to be patient, not, not ride the hype waves, but no, it's important. I think particularly this bear market, maybe we're coming out of it. Who knows? We're hovering around 28 and a half thousand dollars right now. There's a lot of good headlines out there. Some fake, some real. We had Larry Fink on CNBC earlier this week saying that quote unquote crypto is the flight to safety asset or one of the flight to safety assets that people will be flooding into as the turmoil in the world continues to increase both on the financial side and the geopolitical side of things. Um, and alongside that in parallel, I mean, we've talked about this many times in the last few months on this show, but it just becomes more pronounced day in and day out. I think particularly with the partnership that on ramp and BitGo. Um, are announcing this week after we record this, but by the time this is live, it will have been announced. I think the infrastructure at the base layer of the industry that actually gives people access to Bitcoin, the asset in the network is more mature than it has ever been. And we're setting standards in this bear market that will be long lasting moving forward, um, which is really exciting to see. Yeah, and maybe before going um, into BitGo, Mitch, I'd love to hear kind of like, so you had this journey close to 10 years, I think it was your whole career, mm -hmm. and coming into um, to BitGo, like what the process was looking at other firms and then deciding on BitGo because, you know, there's interactions across your organization and they're world class in the sense of like, it's just a different built firm. Um, and I think it goes back to like Mike being a former Googler and just like having the operational execution chops and then it just stems from the top, but we'd just love to hear kind of like what the culture and how that process was. Uh, cause it's just been, it's been like eye opening and refreshing. Cause we've seen a lot of people in this industry do the opposite of it and they don't exist anymore. And so we'd love to just hear kind of like how that process went and like what ultimately made you choose BitGo before, you know, jumping into BitGo and as a whole. For sure. So, I mean, breaking into this industry is not easy. Um, so really how I started, it was 11 years at IBM. And how do I take what I do best at IBM and then bring that into the industry? So focused, I was a B2B seller. Um, how do I, like, let, let's try to stay in that realm and, you know, repurpose that for, you know, broadly, you know, as crypto, my, you know, Obviously, my, my heart's in Bitcoin, but uh, you know, was casting the net out. Um, I, I knew wallets, you know, I say fairly deeply. Um, you know, spent some time. Uh, you know, I've been a Casa customer, I think, since 2019. Um, you know, had a great multi-sig setup before before I came in. Uh, but I was really looking for how I can really move into the IBM of the industry. Um, I know how to sell a you know a solution that might be more expensive but is you know more reliable uh, more secure and you know 
the, the old mantra of nobody gets fired for, for buying IBM, um, was trying to you know, replicate that uh, for this industry, especially one that uh, you know, you've got to rely on your counterparty you know, being there um, you know, tomorrow, the next year, and the next five years. Um, I think it was, it was largely, largely that, um, that, that, that brought me in. And, um, you know, as far as, you know, what, you know, I, I personally, um, you know, we do, we've got quite a bit of platform business, we've got quite a bit of institutional business. Um, I, I wanted to focus on, you know, companies that were doing the, you know, the work of onboarding the, you know, the next users, uh, you know, to Bitcoin, um, and feeling that like my work actually, you know, helping those companies, uh, being the critical rails for those companies, uh, definitely, you know, was, was the passion project for me and why I'm here. And what particularly do you think is Bitco again, it's been around for a decade. I think hardcore Bitcoiners understand that they're a pretty integral part of a lot of the infrastructure, particularly on the custodial custodial side of things uh, with their multi-sig product. But I don't think um, many people understand like the uh, unique intricacies and um, sort of process that BitGo has. I don't want to say it's been like a black box, but it's almost been, uh, they've just sort of been nose to the grindstone, getting stuff done and not really worrying about others or doing in the space, at least is the impression that I've gotten being in the space for 10 years. Yeah. So what Bitco, Bitco is a wallet company um, at really at its core focus on, you know, we've got cold, cold storage and hot wallets, um, but really known for, for cold qualified custody. And, and what we do is, um, you know, we've got an arm guard, you know, with bank red vaults, uh, separation of duties where, um, you know, when Bitco is, you know, signing a transaction from cold storage, um, you know, we've got a key signing ceremony where, um, you know, there are multiple people who are going into that vault, um, you know, to go sign key shards and, you know, constitute them together to go, you know, half sign a transaction, uh, which then, you know, gets, uh, Countersigned by by our HSM, um, different different secure location, um, you know, to, to go broadcast to our nodes, and that's how transactions get signed from cold storage at Bitco. Um, you know, it's a pretty tried and true process. That's you know, I think twenty percent of all on chain Bitcoin transactions are going in or out of a Bitco wallet, um, and you know, we've been doing this for ten years, and and it really it works, um, and that's why we're the one of the cornerstones of the industry. Yeah, having you walk through that process of like, these are competencies and and capabilities that have been built over literally a decade. And and coming from a starting point of extreme technical competence where, you know, Mike Belshi is, um, my understanding is invented multi-sig. And so, you know, that's that's your starting point 10 years ago. And the amount of of, uh, process and uh, polish that has accumulated over that 10 year period, it's, you know, it strikes me as like, th- this is obviously the way that people should be, uh, the gold standard for how you should be as an, as an institution, as a company trying to handle your, um, digital asset custody. And, and that's part of what we're so excited about is like through this multi-institution custody model that, that on ramp is, is, um, championing, um, people get to incorporate your best practices into how they are custodying their um, Bitcoin via on-ramp um, without having to build all that that uh, infrastructure and, and know-how that you guys have built over 10 years. Yeah, so- I, think, um, I think it's important also like BitGo, and this is something I didn't know, I've, I've learned a lot the past year, but... Um, BitGo has been successful or a portion of its success is like from deeply understanding Bitcoin, uh, the technical aspects of it, and then pushing out security to the edges. And so it's my understanding of the core offering, and it was this understanding of the keys in multi-sig where um, whether it's jurisdictional from the protocol level or whatever reason that BitGo would participate in one of the keys, but then open up their 
um, infrastructure for the exchange or their counterparty to hold two or three of the keys. And so that allows and has allowed for years different uh, variations or flavors of custody, but doesn't centralize the asset and then increase the risk of all the things that we've seen. And I think that just like core first principle starts, to, it starts the foundation of something that can be longstanding because it's, it's baked in at the core of just understanding Bitcoin deeply and then just being an engineer at heart. Um, and I think when that happens, at least from my, uh, experience and background, and Mitch, you can correct me, is that I think that's where the market sometimes doesn't really recognize or know as much of the market share that Bitcoin, BitGo has or the infrastructure that it powers and provides. There's some crazy stats that I don't know off the top of my head, Mitch, you, can, you probably know better. Like one of them is like 20% of all, I think transactions like daily happen via like a BitGo wallet or something in that direction. Um, but because it comes from more of an engineer focus versus like a sales and marketing, that's where it's really like the, it's not to mean a pejorative, but like the blue collar, like the, the sound infrastructure, similar to what you referenced with IBM versus the, the loud and flashy, um, because it's just baked in those ethos. At least that's my perception of it from, from a market participant. Yeah, I mean, you got it right. I think most of our, many of our competitors have an exchange arm, um, and, you know, tend to, you know, because they've got a retail presence in, in that regard, you know, they've got more name recognition than we do. But those you know, that are in the industry definitely um, you know, know about us and know, um, you know that you know, we're a cornerstone here. Yeah, and going back to this particular bear market and this sort of shift, it seems like the perception between of Bitcoin and where it fits in the crypto is beginning, they're beginning to separate. There's this demarcation between Bitcoin and crypto that's becoming clear mm -hmm. after 15 years of almost 15 years since the white paper launched. It'll be in 13 days, which is hard to imagine. Wow. Um, there has been a lot of pump and dumps, a lot of hype cycles, and it seems like I don't want to speak too soon or jinx anything or call like peak crypto, but it does seem like this particular bear market, and especially after the FTX debacle and Celsius and BlockFi and Three Hours Capital, all of that, Terra Luna, go down the list, has really positioned Bitcoin in the eyes of institutional allocators as something that is unique and different uh, than, than crypto. And it seems like BitGo uh, is really leaning into this as well at this particular point in time where it's okay, let's focus on the most important asset, which is Bitcoin. Has there been a shift internally in the focus on Bitcoin specifically? A lot to break out on, on, on this question. Uh, I'd say at least internally. Um, I know we had some conversations post FTX that were, you know, while well, we, yes, we, we support 700 plus assets and as a custodian, um, you, know, you sort of need to, to be around. Um, you know, I think there was a there, there was I mean, there was certainly an internal push to increase the the amount of Bitcoin business that we were doing, um, just to to ensure you know, Bitcoin makes money on you know one of the biggest metrics is assets under custody, and if you know that metric goes down because price action for for an asset goes down, Bitcoin makes less money. Um, I think there was a, you know certainly a focus that you know, Bitcoin is going to have lasting power here. Um, and in, in a bear market, let's um, you know make sure we, we shift some energy you know in that regard. Um, I'd say you know one of the you know, as far as Bitcoin as a focus and you know why you're starting to see a lot more from us. Uh, Bitco has really all uh, one of really the you know, the critical failure points um, you know for for us would be you know. If there was, you know, some sort of, you know, technical issue, soft hard fork that happened in Bitcoin, and we needed, you know, the, you know, the technical team to go support that, um, and because of that, you've got absolutely outstanding, you know, tech, like technical resources that we've had from, you know, Jameson Lop to Brandon Black to, you know, our, our Bitcoin team is out, out, outstanding here, and I think we had we had a moment where. We, we, you know, very much believe we've got the best commercial wall in the industry, and it, we we had the thought of how do we not just secure assets in those wallets, but how do we 
actually help companies build products and services and, you know, actually productize and put those wallets in the hands of the most people and actually do the hard work of, you know, onboarding Bitcoiners here. Um, you know, focusing in a post FTX world of, you know, I think a narrative in the next, you know, cycle is going to, custody is going to matter. Um, you know, whether, you know, multi-institution cu custody, like what we're talking with OnRamp to, um, you know, what we did with Swan Vault, uh, you know, where the infrastructure, uh, you know, behind, uh, you know, the Swan key and that key signing um, to, you know, what we're seeing, you know, at Unchained in that announcement. Uh, I think we need solutions and we need to do a better job as the industry to to go provide solutions to, to you know, help onboard those retail users and have them feel better about, uh, you know, the story that we're telling here. Um, so I think because of, you know, opening up those wallets, you know, there was a bigger um, presence that at least we had, you know, if you read Bitcoin Miami, um, you know, Bitcoin was everywhere. And we had the same with Pacific Bitcoin. I think we were, we're doubling and tripling down on the uh, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin only, or Bitcoin first space. Yeah. Yeah. I got I got a I got a great tote bag from a, a Bitcoin <laughs> Miami for, that has Bitco on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, you know, I keep thinking about how if we're if we're really gonna if this is turning into digital gold, mm -hmm. and it's still very early in that um, monetization process, bootstrapping from zero to matching gold, let's say, of twelve trillion dollars. We're at five hundred billion, so we're still early in that process, and to get further into the adoption curve, we have to cross the chasm. You know, the, the, the spooky meta, uh, um, metaphor there of like, how do you go from your early adopters to your mainstream? And the way you do that is not only through like effective marketing or propagating the value proposition of Bitcoin, but the, the tooling has to get better. It has to get easier, more secure, more reliable. And I, in my mind, BitGo is like at the forefront of that um, process of making institutional capital um, more comfortable with Bitcoin as an asset because BitGo is you know, creating better solutions for for feeling confident that you know your your Bitcoin is going to stay in your vault until the time when you decide to to move it. Um, and you know, with FTX and Prime Trust and Fortress Trust, the, there there has been ample reason to, to doubt that that's the case. But the way we're going to get pa past the chasm is because the Bitcoin native companies who are doing it right, Bitco first and foremost in my mind, um, are creating that tooling to make it easier for people to take the leap into Bitcoin. Yeah, I think that's a really important note because ultimately what we're talking about de democratizes the ability to build a business or a company and all the things that Mitch referenced on the different s styles of custody. They're all right and they're all wrong. And that's why it's so controversial when it comes to custody because it's always moving all the time for everybody. And for whatever reason in the industry, it hasn't been like gotten through yet where everybody believes there's a certain form of custody that should exist. And it's just not true. Everybody has their own unique risk factors and will continue to change based on whatever it's personal or the price appreciation and everything in between. And so BitGo, instead of saying, this is how we feel you should do it, or you have to build or leverage our solution for X, it's like, hey, we believe that this native you know, technology along with keys are important. And we talk about it a lot, but it's like very often externally do I hear it talked about where like hash rate you know, nodes are important. I think keys are right up there. I think it's one A, one B, one C because of the fact that like if all, if you have all the hash rate, you know, decentralized, but you have the key sitting on two exchanges, it's not a good situation. And so uh, it's just cool like to see that as part of the guiding principle of how you guys think about infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I, we have the most, you know, decentralized money, you know, really, that, that the world has ever seen and yeah, how it exists today. It's sitting on the most centralized you know, financial systems that <laughs> we've ever encountered, um, you know, where your exchanges are, you know, for the most part, you know, holding the actual assets themselves and, you know, they're the broker dealer. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute mess. And, and, and it's sometimes over... sitting in like in text files um, as FTX uh, revealed. I know. Um, so I, I think 
And it's because of that, that, you know, when you talk to you know, most of the population out there, your, your normie friends, that, you know, we get laughed at and we've got to actually build these rails properly and to actually make this, you know, a success and you know, let us actually win here. Yeah. It's like the beginning of 2000, a space odyssey or 2001, a space odyssey when Bitcoin's just a, that black rectangular monolith. yeah monolith that people are like slapping like what the hell is this thing just, again almost 15 years in it feels like oh like if we're really going to practice what we preach eat our own dog food here like when we talk about a bitcoin standard like bitcoin has these native properties that allow you to create these new financial products and ways to interact with them like let's leverage the tech and again i do think it's important to really beat this dead horse but like it feels like this cycle particularly has really driven that to everybody's the front of everybody's mind where it's like okay the mount gox uh plenty more bitstamp uh ftx celsius quadriga, quadriga yeah. voyager like they all celsius. simply did not know, know how to manage keys not only that they didn't know how to architect sort of a, a risk um, design, like a, a way to mitigate risk by leveraging Bitcoin's native multi-sig properties. And I've been saying this for two years now, multi-sig, multi-institution, multi-sig, I think will be the standard moving forward. Because when you distribute that key risk uh, at the first layer via multi-sig and then second layer multi-sig via multi-institutions, you're just really dispersing that centralized third-party risk across your security setup. I, yeah, I maybe I, that. Go for it. I was, I was going to say maybe that ties into uh, to the extent as what you you can share, Will, and like we could talk about uh, you know our interaction and kind of like this coming across you know what we're working on and you know you really leaning in along with the team and how that kind of plays into what Marty just uh, talked about. So I, I think I read this in a in an on ramp uh, you know press release, but it was a, a quote that you guys had that. You know, this is this is the first asset that you don't necessarily you don't only have to worry about the actual asset price going to zero, but you can experience a you know a loss of the actual asset and you know have your balance go to zero um, because mismanagement of keys. And I think you know that strikes fear in in a lot of you know RAs and you know asset allocators. Um, but I think you know the setups. You know, looking at multi-institution custody and you know division of that counterparty risk, I, I don't know how you can have a fundamental um, understanding of Bitcoin and the asset and not think this is a better model. Um, you know, the ability to you know you've got a two or three key signing structure where you're relying on three institutions, and something happens to institution number three or one, and you know working with the other two institutions to go you know, move to migrate to another wallet where you've got a, you know, another sound institution holding a third key. Um, I, it, it just simply makes sense. Um, you know, when Michael, you, you mentioned when, when I, this first came across my desk and, you know, my I first started talking to you guys, I think you fundamentally got that. Um, you know, I think, you know, this idea of multi-institution custody is not, not necessarily new, but the, unrelenting focus on doing this and building this the right way where the, you know, the user is in, you know, can there, there's no situation where, where these funds can get moved, um, you know, without a user's permission, um, to, you know, truly building the company, you know, with, with this as the mindset and, you know, the core competency, and that's what you're going to market with. Um, I just, you know, I saw the vision. I saw, you know, really the unrelenting uh, focus on, you know, that core competency. And um, that's why you guys stuck out to me. And I think to really help listeners visualize this who may be a bit new to this concept as a whole, I mean, just think about the banking crisis that that happened earlier this year. It started actually probably this time last year and rolled into the the first quarter of this year, second quarter, actually. Um, like imagine if, you, know, you were a Silicon Valley bank customer and you're hearing rumors that there's a run on your bank and 
um, you're scaring to get away, move your funds, set up another bank account to move your funds to, or move your funds to a bank account you already have set up and you're worried. And luckily for those customers, they got bailed out uh, by the government and they were made whole, but you can easily make the argument that that's not going to be true moving forward for all the banks. Obviously we had WAMU fail in 2008 and a bunch of others. Um, but this set up what Bitcoin enables via this multi-institutional model is uh, God forbid it happens, but we would be naive to think it's not possible down the road. If you have your, your fund secured in two or three multi institution, multi-sig and one of those institutions has a run or they're, just simply go bankrupt. So you don't have to freak out as much as Mitch said. You can move your Bitcoin using the other two institutions to a secure wallet, uh, mm-hmm. add in another key into that quorum, another institutional key, uh, and then be set. You don't have to worry as much. And so, like, really comparing this to the incumbent financial system and banking infrastructure, like, it is a step function improvement on peace of mind in terms of knowing that your funds are relatively safe compared to the banking system that exists now. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd take it a little further too and um, say that, you know, in this scenario where Silicon Valley bank happens, uh, you, you're okay because the government's going to step in and, and save you because they control the currency. So they can make more of it. And it's just kind of the, the social contract of, of the of fiat money is that governments are going to step in and that's why that's why you're all right with this system um, and obviously Bitcoin doesn't allow for that and so making the transition as a user as a, as a saver saving your value in uh, a currency that the government will step in and help you and transitioning from that to a currency where nobody can step in to help you ever um, that is a non-starter unless the, the systems in place for the security uh, of that asset in the new system are vastly superior to what exists in the old system. And, and I think that before multi-institution custody, that, in my opinion, was not true for Bitcoin of like, there's risks in self-custody of you might screw it up or you might accidentally reveal too much to some prying eye and get your funds stolen. Self-custody has risks. On the other side, the third-party custodian has risks too. Like That's what we saw with, with Prime Trust, with For- Fortress Trust, with FTX, with, the, with all of the others that you listed before. Um, those are centralized custodians and they screwed up. And users in this world are left holding the bag. In the Silicon Valley bank world, the government steps in to make it so that you know nobody's left, no end user is screwed. But in Bitcoin, the end user gets screwed by, by um, centralized custodians who screw up. And so with both of those models, self-custody and third-party custody, there are risks that make it unattractive or hard to a hard pill to swallow. You're taking a risk setting things up and, and you better you better know that you're you've done it right yourself. That's in my opinion to date the best approach has been self custody where you have to invest a lot of time and energy into setting to learning what you need to do and then setting it up right. And collaborative custody solutions like Unchained or Casa have made that easier. Um, but it's still hard and there's still risks. But now looking forward, going into a multi-institution custody world, that was simply never possible in the, in the dollar universe in the traditional asset landscape, because only with this kind of asset, a, a truly digital asset that's rooted in cryptography, are you able to have this two of three custody solution? That's not possible in, in the traditional world. And that two of three custody solution that Mitch was, was talking about, where if one one of those legs of the tripod goes out, you can swap in a new one. Um, and that level of assurance, I think in, in my mind takes the, the quality of the systems of, of custody in Bitcoin world, it 
creates that order of magnitude improvement on custody that's necessary to go from a world where the government can step in to a, a world where nobody can step in, but it's okay because it's so much safer and, and more secure than, than any previous form of custody ever. So I think that's, I think it's like a tipping point in custody for Bitcoin and that will enable the maturation of the asset class and the adoption of this asset because it, it lowers the barrier to entry for people who have been, you know, scared of, I don't know if I trust um, crypto because FTX happened. But I think, you know, we're going to see multi-institution custody emerge as the gold standard because the FTX scenario can't happen if you've set it up right. Thanks for tuning in to The Last Trade. If you're enjoying the show and want to dive deeper, check us out at onrampbitcoin.com where you'll find a full suite of institutional grade research and analytics, including our recently published white paper, Bitcoin's Full Potential Valuation, and our new tool, the OnRamp Terminal. Now, back to the show. Yeah, I think, I think it's ex- exactly right. I think, um, I think what, what we're talking about here is actually like, to get a little meta in the sense of like, the custody, it's always, the cat's out of the bag, independent of, of OnRamp, and, and Mitch will speak to this and, and maybe we can give even more insights into what we're working on so he can explain, you know, um, BitGo's involvement and why they've invested in this infrastructure. But I think taking a step back, um, I think Bitcoin's very hard to understand for a lot of people because half of it is just assuming that if they took the time to invest in understanding it, it doesn't really matter because it can all go up and smoke either way. And so Mitch alluded to, and I don't know if it was in a blog or if we, if it made it to a draft, but there was something that we were saying or like playing around with the wording of like, never has it been before where you're like looking at an asset and then maybe you want to allocate to, and then you, you possibly could be a zero the next day because of misappropriation of funds or, or leverage or whatever it is. And so to Jesse's point, like if you live in this world where it can always disappear, you keep hearing the number of 200 million wallet addresses, 200 million. But the reality is it's like one one hundredth, if not less of that has material exposure to Bitcoin because most people have it as a flyer. And it's like, oh, it can always disappear. I don't want to take possession because I mess it up. But the exchange, if they go under, it's just like whatever. And it's this chicken or egg with whether it's institutions or individuals and like, do I really even want to like go down this rabbit hole or understand it? It has been the best performing asset, all the things we know, but this reality of like, it can just be taken at a moment's notice and there is no recourse and we know there's no bailouts, but then to the point of increasing redundancy and uh, reducing counterparty risks starts to bring a different kind of market structure for individuals to step in and then all and feel very confident in like, okay, so the custody, the asset, similar to if I bought Amazon stock or if I bought gold, you know, counterparty risk, I think is going to come to the forefront in all things, just given the the nature of uh, uh, leverage in the system and that some people just can't, are going to be left holding the bag and that's going to suck. And that's where I think counterparty risk in Bitcoin starts to really make sense as a, like a value prop that most people discount, but it's a different story. It's more of just the fact that like you can get exposure to something and no, again, there are no, uh, there are no perfect um, solutions for custody in my mind. There are perfect trade-offs, and there is a reality that things can happen in, in multi-institution that still have your Bitcoin loss. But our vision of the future, at least on the on-ramp side, is that as the market grows in reputations and trust is built, it's similar in financial institution and in like the free banking world, where those who fulfill their obligations, those who fulfill their security uh, requirements, and all the things associated with you know, storing cryptographic material and fulfilling the obligations will be the market leaders in participating. And then obviously those that have the TXT file in the drawer will not. Jesse, you mentioned a few weeks ago, um, I think it was something along the lines of innovation in the custody space has certainly lagged what's what's possible um, on chain and, you know, in the asset itself. Um, You know, Mike actually said something similar at Pacific Bitcoin last week or two weeks ago when he said, you know, we have the infrastructure in place to to handle billion dollar wallets, uh, and we we have a few at Bitco. What we don't have in place is you know what's going to be required to for the trillion dollar wallet, and when the industry actually grows there, like we all believe it does, um, and it's things like multi institution custody, it's things like time locks. Um, you know, God forbid a key is lost. Um, you know, 
new ways to recover them. Uh, and it's the things that we're going to be focused on over here to, you know, and the businesses like you guys that, that we need to enable to, you know, place the rails down right now in this bear market for, you know, the rapid appreciation, you know, we expect to come in the years to come. Yeah. Time locks, mini script, vaults, covenants, whatever it may be. I mean, out of that but, list, I think mini scripts, the only thing that's possible right now, but things that P- Bitcoin is are talking about on the line, things like covenants. There's and no bolts. innovation. There's no innovation on Bitcoin. That's, that's all happening elsewhere, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> Let them think that. Let them think that. I love that people think that gives us more alpha, more time to accumulate. But I think it's important to note pulling on this thread even further, like the existence of multi-institution custody I mean, we were analoging it to the incumbent banking system. And yes, Michael, I know you mentioned there still could be some pitfalls within this model and ways to rug people. But I do think the fact that it exists and is out there creates an incentive structure that really reduces the likelihood of this because it becomes much harder. And you're sort of forced since you're in this quorum with other institutions that have their own reputations that they want to preserve, like the, the, likelihood of fuckery for lack lack of a better term goes down pretty significantly i think that's exactly right like jesse and i talk about this and i think we both have coalesced around a vision of uh this will be a little controversial in this call and it'll be for a while is like most institution it doesn't have to be two of three it can be two of four three or four client participates ultimately ends up where 80 percent of bitcoin is custody long term bitcoin ends up as money but the important part about self-custody and the fact that you can spin up a wallet or set up a multi-sig wallet or collaborative custody where you hold unilateral control keeps everybody honest it's that valve that you can take the asset out and you can always prove when you want is that gun you know to everybody's head saying like hey i don't have to trust you i can actually take it out and then bring it back and that's like if you guys listen or mitch if you heard the glenn cartwright it's been so fun um doing all the stuff we're doing because we haven't announced all the products and the services we're going to build around multi-institution from the ground up but then it clients coming our way saying hey like we're look we've been looking for this like we've been looking for a fund that has reduced counterparty risk or be able to take delivery and so to the point of like this cycle and what you guys are building for and what we're building it's like we we think it's a very opportunistic time because the market's going to come back as we know it with a vengeance probably greater than anything we've ever seen the past 15 years and all the right tooling is going to like start to you know surface to the top because people have recognized like hey i don't want to get rugged again it is amazing i I get to work with most of the the large bitcoin platforms out there amazing watching the building that's going on right now as the rails really are getting laid for for the next bull run um you know companies focused on you know Make, like look, when FTX happened, um, everyone was trying to figure out how do we still trade, um, you know, with market makers, you know, going down and liquidity drying up. Um, you know, we have to build the redundancy, resiliency to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, so between you know the large players building out, you know, second, third, fourth options, you know, to keep trade going, to you know, rethinking business models and, you know, custody solutions, um, you know, like what you guys are doing, what Swan's doing, um, you know, figuring out how to actually do lending the right way, um, you know, how to do that on chain, how to, you know, do that where you know, you're, you know, there's no really, you know, risk of, um, you know, the blowups that happened over collateralization, like, these are the things that are getting focused on right now. It's beautiful watching. It's like, like really inspiring and um, privileged to be a part of it. Yeah. I mean, the, the fascinating thing is um, I said a lot about the, the meta and like the market perception in the head because of just having lots of conversations the past, you know, three years in onboarding. And I, I feel the same way about what I'm about to say on, I don't think there's another firm, honestly, on the planet Earth that's doing or would have done what BitGo is doing. We can probably get into like what they're doing with OnRamp, but it's because we've talked to the Fidelities and the BNY Mellons and large scale firms. And while they're doing a lot in the digital asset ecosystem, they're still mired in the, in the first principles thinking from their old world of financial services and you want to control and hold all of the asset um, to be able to do what you want to, whether it's relend or control or charge on it. Um, 
And the problem is that we've seen over the past 15 years in Bitcoin's history, like that's just a recipe for failure and disaster because that's not what the asset wants to do. It doesn't want to centralize for a number of reasons. And so to see you guys building like that, it's like, it, it makes sense from a Bitcoin angle or from somebody that's like native, you can call it, go as far as crypto native. But once you come from the old world, it's like, why would you ever do anything like this? And so it's just, a, that thought hit me because I don't think the new leaders or the leaders that end up building the financial products of the future, I, I feel like few, if any, will be incumbents because it's such a radical shift in how you treat an asset and risk. Uh, as we've seen, like BlockFi, you know, God bless them. Like they're just going to be a poster child because it's just the exact model that you don't want to do. And I just fear like a BlackRock is going to be BlockFi at orders of magnitude larger. Um, same concept, centralization, doing potentially some other things that are going to paper BTC. And then at the end of the day, if you get caught off sides, there's a bunch of people left holding the bag. I think that like the reason why, you know, we did this, if you look at Mike's background at Google, Lookout, uh, you know, companies based in Palo Alto, you know, part of Silicon Valley. It's technology is, you know, in our DNA, it's at the forefront here. Um, you know, we open source all our wallets. Um, it's because we know it's the most secure way to do it. Um, and, you know, really at our core, we're able to sort of think with that, you know, disruptor, you know, mindset of, you know, we've got to make sure we're still here. Um, and, you know, knowing that, you know, like you said, the, the asset want, you know, is decentralized and, you know, and wants to find that home. Uh, and, you know, I hope the market plays out that that, that is the case. Uh, we've got to play in that world. And I think we can, we can kind of see around that corner and, you know, make sure, you know, at least in the Bitcoin space where, you know, if, if we're not, you know, the, the sole custodian of the asset, how do we make sure we're the best key agent in the industry? Um, and, you know, if, you know, we're making, you know, less money doing that, um, you know, perhaps we actually three, four X revenue because more capital is actually coming into the industry because they actually trust the infrastructure and the models that are being built for, for custody. Um, it's a long-term bet, but I, uh, I think it's good for the industry and I think it'll be good for Bitco too. Completely agree. And it's, Michael, you mentioned the incumbents. I think that is going to be the innovator's dilemma that they they are confronted with. And Mitch, you just made a great point. Like it is counterintuitive, particularly if you're using incumbent business models and trying to apply them to Bitcoin. Like there is a very strong case to be made that yes, doing this multi-institution custody model uh, and sort of splitting up fees let's just be frank like this, this is what's going to happen if we go to this model is uh, the fee structure that exists in the com incumbent world where one institution holds the assets and reaps fees from that like that's going to get um, sort of shattered and split amongst many institutions it's creating these new business models in these new fee structures that that work within this new paradigm due to the fact that we can build these models with Bitcoin's multi-sig technology. And that is going to be a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. And I agree with you, like swallow the pill early and have the vision to recognize that it is worth swallowing the pill because the market's going to be so massive that even if you're getting smaller fees in a multi-institution model, uh, the overall revenue is likely going to be larger in the future because we're going to be dealing with one of the most important, most valuable assets on the planet. Yeah. And maybe this is a good time to take a step back because I think we have a lot of context for what we're talking about. Maybe the audience does it. And then the ultimately the innovator's dilemma that Mitch is sharing. Um, it, I don't know, Mitch, do you want me to like share or would it be helpful for you to, from your, from your eyes, what we're working on in your part in it? Why, why don't you go for it? I'll, I'll fill in the, uh, yeah, some details. Okay. We can leave it Logan like this. We can turn it into a conversation. I think I'll, um, we're going to record, uh, a more focused pod on what we're launching in the history. So this will be just like a paraphrase and, and Jesse, please jump in or I'll defer on some aspects of it. But, um, when we launched on ramp, we had this vision of, you know, multi-institution that it was a differentiator and it was more important, like just in the same way from a Bitcoin 
uh, first principle that we talked about with Mike, like you just don't want to have unilateral control. You don't want to have unilateral control from a risk perspective. Like imagine any of us having to go to sleep at night, managing billions of dollars and they're under your provision, let alone, um, you know, from whether it's the government, any reason you just don't necessarily want to be, have that, but also from what we've seen in the market. And this is before a lot of the, the blowups that we had started with this like vision close to over a year ago now. Um, but then adding a few other components to it, which was like the GBTC uh, situation with the you know spot price and trading at a discount um, or premium, and uh, this fact that like funds don't allow for delivery and there's like natural precedent, you know, Bitcoin's a commodity. We embarked on this journey, Jesse and I, with his background um, managing a fund and mine managing you know onboarding individuals to multisig that there was a better way to just reduce that. And so we started, uh, you know, the first spot Bitcoin trust in the U.S. or in, in Nash, internationally that was leveraging this multi-institution model. The problem or the issue with it was that we were directing the clients. Like we had the keys uh, split up, Bitco's core, core model. There's others that are out there like it. Bitco holds a key, Kingdom Trust, and in this new model, uh, CoinCover will be announced as a partner, and then OnRamp. Um, and that's what we were in the process of building. We launched that. We had a lot of demand. We brought on clients. We had international demand for different products. And so we started to look at, well, what are the other things that we're doing here in that crawl? Like, what are the core principles we're doing? And we came, you know, obviously Bitcoin only. We're building this brand that we believe is going to be trusted in the space that ties to a lot of Jesse's and our team's content that helps and educate. Um, but then this multi-institution is a core pillar around it. But we were still, and I don't actually even go, know if what we were doing in the sense of if we were going to go with that model, because what Marty alluded to is the hard part. Getting the keys separated is actually the easy part. It's a, it just takes recognizing them. We can all set up our own multi-institution. The hard part is getting a financial institution or somebody with a track record like BitGo to say, hey, I will participate, but not only will I participate, I will own the client relationship and I will actually onboard them and I will leverage you know, the things that I can share a little bit that make BitGo unique in this situation. That was the part where Mitch stepped in, saw what we were doing. I was like, oh, this makes sense. And um, I'll just give a teaser on it and Mitch will explain more, but BitGo's unique positioning in this and why we really think this unlocks large scale allocations and also movement of custody funds at the you know incumbents i would think of coinbase as as an incumbent at this point is the simple fact that we can never unilaterally direct any of the uh institutions to move funds in the way we've set up our custody structure always requires that the client not only gets onboarded with multiple institutions and bitco will have their own but then at the end of the day, they have to do the same in reverse order in whatever permissions the you know principles or parties set. And then the other aspect is BitGo and the the way that they're utilizing their key um, in that in this quorum has really never been done. And I'll maybe hand it over to Mitch if he wants to kind of share like a little bit more about that. It's funny you guys mentioned Innovators Dawn that's been sitting on my my desk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was trying to really step back and think: Is this is this technology that that you know, that is disruptive, or or is it sustaining for the the existing players? And you know, to be honest, like what we built on the the PSBT side, uh, which is how we how we accept uh, a half signed transaction, you know, from from on ramp, so Bitco can countersign. Yeah, and for any listener out there, PSBT sound, stands for a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's not easy work. You know, everybody in the industry is running different tech. Um, so, you know, adopting that standard, um, you know, was difficult. You know, we're, we're there now. Um, you know, we continue to innovate on it. Uh, but I, I do think that, you know, if this is the model of the future, and I personally, in my heart of hearts, do believe that, you know, the existing incumbents are going to be left behind. And you're going to have, you know, new players that, that come in that, that truly you know, understand, you know, from, you know, that, that this matters, um, how to set up companies to, to be key agents rather than, you know, true custodians, uh, you know, in the way that we do it, where we're holding, you know, three keys. Um, and you're going to see companies, companies die as a result of this is, you know, the future here. Yeah, it really does come back to, uh, yeah, I, I think Bico, Mitch, you having uh, the innovator's dilemma on your desk shows that you guys are are um, approaching 
change in this industry uh, from the mindset of Netflix as a, a as a mail order uh, DVD business or whatever, however you would call that. Um, seeing, you know, oh, there's a shift to digital streaming that's going to happen and we're going to get in front of it versus being a blockbuster, which I think I think will be the fate of a lot of traditional custodians, people who are unprepared to a- adopt um, a mentality of multi-institution models um, because because there's a long history of, of, you know, the best way to do custody is to, to build your fortress and guard it well and hope for the best. Put some um, keys you know. in the Swiss Alps, you know, just yep. bury them on yeah, the mountains. And, and guard the hell out of them. And, and that's, that's been what's been best because, you know, that's, that's why we have, that's why we built banks and, and vaults to put the gold in because, you know, put, put them under, put it, put it in a big vault with some guards and that's the best you, you got in the physical world. And there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of institutions who come from the traditional finance world in, in particular, who are unprepared to accept a, a changed model of the best way to do custody in the digital landscape is through the collaboration of multiple entities. That's that's completely paradigm breaking for how custody has been done. And I think it gives a big advantage to companies like BitGo and OnRamp who are inherently thinking about it from you know a digital first um, mindset and are prepared to to take on what I what I think will become the you know the gold standard in in how custody is done for any asset because Bitcoin can be custodied vastly better orders of magnitude better more securely than traditional assets because of the properties that we're only just beginning to unlock yeah and I think what will be really interesting to see i agree i think we all agree this is going to be the standard and what i'm very fascinated to find out is how quickly it becomes the standard because that's i think if we truly believe this i think it should be our goal as individuals in this space and operators in this space to make it clear to the market that this is superior and you we really we can do it as much marketing and explaining as we want via this show and all of our uh, materials that we send to prospective clients and uh, content to educate just individuals out there. But I do think at the end of the day, for this to become the standard, there has to be that that mental light switch that goes off in individual market participants' heads that says, no, I got to demand, I'm demanding this. Like I'm not interacting with a company that does not custody Bitcoin this way. Yeah, I think that like we have a really unique perspective on this and this is where we focus our, our, where Mitch appreciates is like, we're building this firm from the ground up around this uh, vision, a multi-institution. And the reality is it's not available for everybody. And the reason why it's not available for everybody, because it, it requires a lot of, like when you think about um, the institutional overhead and it's, it's very often thought, right? Like Bitcoin, cause it's digital you shouldn't trade for execution. You shouldn't pay for execution. You shouldn't pay for custody, but like there's a whole slew in the same way that, you know, gold has between exchange and commissions from the time it either gets out of the earth or like the London bar to the time you buy a coin. There's a lot of things in between. And the same thing that happens when you're cryptographically safeguarding and running a business. Um, So there's fees associated where that ties in to is I think it starts there. I know it starts there. I believe it to start there because institutions can pay for that. And because the upside is so great in Bitcoin that it will be justified. But then just like any like, you know, technology, you start from the top end. And then as you be able, as, as you're able to not only, um, as you're able to just in, innovate and refine and have better processes, it starts to get democratized. And why I say all of that is to Marty's point about like, well, who's going to recognize it? The reason why people aren't going to recognize it right off the bat, some will, and we see it, is because there's a big fallacy in the industry, and it doesn't ever get talked about, I'm excited to bring up, is that custody has been subsidized by fiat, money, and venture. Every business that runs a custody shop that doesn't charge for it is is paid for and is practically losing money. And at in one point, so this is why people lose like their keys or why like custody, they use it as a loss leader. And so when you do that, it's like hard for people to perceive, why would I pay for custody? Like I just keep it at X. So they can't charge for it. 
But the second you start to differentiate, and I'll go as far as saying the one thing for sure people should pay for is custody. If it's differentiated and you feel comfortable that the Bitcoin will be there because the delta between 27K and wherever we all think Bitcoin can go, whatever your benchmark is, is worth whatever the BIPs, as long as you know that you feel in high confidence, this is the best solution for you. And so that's the that will be the equilibrium shift or that mindset shift in the market is you should actually be paying for custody because that's how you keep the asset and most people have not and so these firms that either hold in your bitcoin participate in bitcoin if they're not profitable they you don't know who's going to hold that firm at the end of the day that's your counterparty so they could be acquired by somebody they could go out of business and so you always want to know like where are the assets or how are individuals paying for that because that's your that's your ultimate your counterparty it's facilitating the economic you know equivalent of a transaction and signing um so anyway i think that's where the custody mindset is going to sh- mind sh- set is going to shift is the people that can pay for it, the people that recognize it. And then ultimately, as these other firms that aren't making money with custody say, hey, why don't I just participate? Because I already built all this infrastructure. And so we'll see it in the crypto world. And then ultimately, the financial world, if you can sell it good enough, it's like you don't have to build, you know, $10 million worth of infrastructure, participate in a key core and build the right, you know, processes. And now you're in the economy and now you can start generating revenue and you don't lose your, your flow of dollars out to the coin bases of the world. So I think it's going to be a burn, but um, yeah, that was a long way of saying, it. I think that's how this plays out. It's not right off the bat, but for the money it'll, it will be. I do think that like, you're going to, like you said, you're going to have people who realize right away this business model. Um, I think, you know, credit to you guys, uh, you know, for knowing that, you know, this solution is going to have a lot of value. Uh, there is a differentiator here. And, you know, from a monetization standpoint, you know, making sure, you know, you're not doing this as a loss leader, you know, and, you know, running, you know, some you know, venture back company where, you know, you, you know, you keep that, that operation going. It's, it's knowing what you have, making sure you sell it um, to, you know, for, for the actual, you know, value that you're bringing and, you know, really good on you guys. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's the un, uh, under discussed uh, thing is the multi-institution makes sense in our head, but at the end of the day, like new uh, custody models are, are one at the margins. Like you have to get the person that's like, they know Coinbase, they understand it. And, and it's it's this uh, visceral feeling. We talked about it a lot at Unchain. When you like, unle- it's it's very it's it's eerily similar to uh, venture, mm-hmm. in that if you're allocating money and you're not in it full time, an LP won't give you their dollars because those are their full time dollars. Mm-hmm. In the same way that unless you like know the model in and out, whether it was like the, in your head or you use it or it was you visually understand it at the margins with a new custody product you have to be able to translate that to a person parking their their wealth, their dollars, or it just looks like, because I've sold a lot of things in my life, whether it was like at Google or at WeWork, it's like you can get good enough to fake things. Like you can get good enough to be dangerous. But when it comes to like real wealth and money, people know exactly, that's like the one thing that they can look at and say like, ah, oh, this this guy doesn't know exactly what what's going. And that's where we're excited about this because this is like all in our brains. This is like years of culmination of like all the things we've been working on to say like, okay, this is where we see the market going. And so, yeah, we're, we're incredibly excited to have it out. I think like, like similar to, you know, what we do today and, you know, some of the companies that we're, you know, positioned against, like true cold storage, you know, is in, you know, how I outline, you know, how we store keys in vaults, like that story works. And, you know, it's got 10 years of working and ultimately, like, obviously that stuff's more expensive. And, but when, you know, we're treating these assets like they're going to be the trillion dollar assets, you know, that we believe they will be. And, you know, when you're talking a couple bips here and there of, of, you know, difference in cost, I, you know, as long as you're talking to an audience that understands the value of what they're holding, I, you know, I do think, you know, you're going to have people who get that right away. And then slowly, probably as price goes up, you know, you'll, you'll see more demand and see more interest and more people that get it. But, you know, it's now really the time to go lay that foundation and uh, do this the right way. No, I mean, just when the price starts ripping, that bag gets really heavy metaphorically. 
Mm -hmm. and it weighs on you and your mind if (laughs) at one point you you get a bunch of bitcoin the price is low you you write down your 12 word seed phrase on a piece of paper you put it in your sock drawer the price runs 10x that that piece of paper is on your mind pretty pretty much all day every day (laughs) and then that's when for me personally that's when i was like all right i need to spin up an unchained vault distribute this get this risk out of my mind um but you like when you bring in institutions and the type of capital that we're talking about like if i as an individual think that bag is heavy you can only imagine how heavy it gets for for large institutions that are fiduciaries on behalf of hundreds of thousands millions of individuals that's such a good I remember when I had my Casa wallet for the first time, it was 2019, and I had, I had moved the funds over, uh, one hardware wallet, I had a three of five, um, was already distributed. And, you know, I was sitting there uh, going to bed at night and you know, realized that you know, one of the keys was my phone, had two at home. It's like someone, you know, you get the, you know, the, uh, you know, whatever, the $2, $10 wrench attack, like someone can go take all these funds. And this was, you know, we were, we were starting to rip you know, 2019 on price. Um, and you know, if I, as you know, somebody who you know, is a lot more native, um, having these fears have screwed this up to the degree that, you know, I've, I, we've got a critical point of failure here. Um, you know, how are we going to onboard, you know, the next users, um, who, who are not as native, um, we've got to make this a lot easier. Um, and really think through these problems a lot better than we have. Yeah, I think that's the interesting point because it's the same dynamic or concept. I listened to Mike's talk and it was it's really good. It was cool to hear, you know, his supporting of people at BitGo that, you know, the the BitGo mafia that seems to be building outside of BitGo. Um, but then also him thinking through like trillion dollar wallets. We don't use that term a lot, but I guess with the amount of dollars printed, we're going to be using it more Um but the same way of a trillion dollar wallet, how do you build a business? It's like, how do you build a custody solution for yourself? Like as an individual, when the price to Marty's point goes at 10 X or a hundred, and we just like aren't prepared for that uh, as individuals, just, we've never seen it, but then it happens and you like start freaking out. And that's where I always anchor back to. It's like, do we really like right now, you know, leverage collaborative custody personally, but there's a certain point where I think about to Mitch's points, like if somebody knew it's the whole, uh, it's like Michael Saylor and Balaji where Balaji references that there's never been a billion until Bitcoin. There's never been a billionaire, like a true billionaire that you can like move a billion dollars whenever you want at a moment's notice. And that's powerful, but it's also scary because if you wake up and somebody knows whether you're early or somebody's data gets leaked or whatever reason that you have a bag of Bitcoin, do you really want it to be known that somebody can pick up your child or that somebody can pick up something and coerce you or manipulate you into being able to affect control of the asset versus today, if somebody wants to do that, it's just impossible because you have to go to the bank, you got to call, you got to, you know, there's a bunch of things to do to really move money in size like that. And so I think that's just not fully understood. And, and what we talked about before, if you set up your own custody everybody can do it it's not rocket science the problem is it takes a good while it takes a good while to set it up and then it takes a good while to understand where all the backups are how you can reconstitute how you can recover if somebody goes down if you have a collaborative custody partner what happens if they go away and that that's not again rocket science the problem is most people have a lot of other things to do and they don't have the six plus months to make sure that they do it and where it gets really heady is we all know this turns into money like at the end of the day this thing ends up being money. We go from 2% allocations that people have or institutions to 10% and 50 and whatever the number is. And it's okay to leave it on Coinbase when it's 1% or 2% or 5%. But if it starts becoming like your entire net worth, are you really feel comfortable like leaving it right underneath the desk, you know, in your setup or whatever the case may be? It just all starts. It gets really, uh, as Marty said, uh, the bag gets a lot heavier, even though it's digital. And that's the idea of building this. So whether it's today, somebody realizes, or when it's the price 10 X is, there's just a solution ready for them to be able to trust. Yeah. If you're new to this industry, you're getting in, in this bear market, just let this be a warning. That bag gets heavy. If you don't secure it properly, we got to, uh, you got to uh, embarrass Mitch a little because I don't think all this stuff we're doing happens unless Mitch and Mitch and, and Mike, but Mitch like recognized it and also like 
really saw the vision of where this can go and why the importance uh, of it when you were alluding to your CASA. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens that's path dependent in this process and in all things. And you had all those like things already in your head. It's like, oh, this actually makes sense. Because again, we tell BitGo, but the reality is it still takes individuals to like recognize things and be able to champion them. I appreciate that. I, I don't know, stepping back into you know my story and you know what got me here, I was trying to see how I could figure out how I can use my skills to you know go help Bitcoin adoption in some way. And I was selling software. So you know, really the ability to help Bitcoin companies and to you know, really enable you guys to, to go do that hard work that, you know, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, a you know, greater privilege and, you know, better thing that I could be working on. So uh, I'm grateful for you guys and doing the hard work and, you know, let me navigate the, the big company here. Uh, that's what I was doing at IBM. That's what I do here. Um, and go try to make, uh, you know, meaningful change by, by enabling you guys. You tell Mitch is a Bitcoiner because he went directly to the $10. He like accounted for inflation with the, uh, Ten dollar wrench attack. It was like, <laughs> it's Brooklyn Brooklyn wrench prices are probably <laughs> right now. <laughs> Wrenches but are not part of the price. core CPI. Um, so, yeah, no, it is. So I guess I don't know if you guys talk about this internally at BitGo. Obviously, I haven't been involved uh, with the day to day conversations that you guys have been having between each other. But like in terms of how the opportunity like what opportunity lays before BitGo? like how do you guys view yourselves like 10 years out 50 years out 100 years out like what types of institutions are we building right now whether it's BitGo, on ramp tftc uh 1031 like what like how do you see like the mark that we're beginning to leave now looking again 10 50 100 years out i mean i I think it's the future of money um, and future of finance. Where you know, I think J Jesse mentioned, you know, this is this is you know American Revolution. Like, I think we're all doing work that you know will be will be in history books one day, and or, or I hope so. I, I think we're going to win. Um, but oh, we're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> if we keep doing the work we're doing, I think we're going to win. Um, but it's it's building in this bear. But ultimately, you know how this shakes out, you know, which institutions, um, you know, bubble up to the top and, you know, have lasting power. I, I kind of, I go back to, you know, the, the Jack Mallers, Jack Dorsey, you know, thought of same team. And it's making sure we don't spend the time bickering with each other. Um, you know, I think it's important we call each other out when, when we screwed up, but it's being collaborative. It's helping each other, um, making sure, you know, we focus on the broader goal of, you know, sound money and uh, you know making the future that we want here we keep our, our eye on the ball there and sort of keep that you know revolutionary spirit that grit that we've all got that powers us to uh you know keep waking up every day and doing what we do i think we do win yeah people see it as naive crazy bombastic but you got to think big we got to dream yeah. big here the, uh, the world as it stands today, as we mentioned earlier, is a bit chaotic and we need big change. And I don't think it's crazy or bombastic or hubristic to say, hey, we're going to change the world. We're going to create these institutions that are long lasting and that people will look back centuries from now and say, holy crap, look at what they did back then. You should have that type of mentality in this industry. I was actually I was having a conversation this morning. Um sort of about negative effects of social media, um, you know, and, you know, go into, you know, Israeli-Palestinian conflict and sort of how the spread of misinformation uh, is damaging and, you know, psychologically. And I sort of, I view, you know, social media uh, as sort of like Pandora's box and all this negative, um, you know, consequences are, are coming out of it. But at the same time, you truly, if we built this right, but you've got the free distribution of ideas and that democratization did not exist beforehand. And I do think that you know, the ability for that information to, to truly spread um, for Bitcoin to truly spread in, you know, global South regions that you know, truly need it most 
um, I, I think will ultimately be that that positive that comes out of Pandora's box. And you know, changing money, changing the world is not easy. Uh, but we do need you know rails like social media, um, you know, and you know, free exchange of ideas to to make that possible. Yeah, it's another paradox that's like weird because you obviously need the internet for Bitcoin, but it's just like the internet. If if you let's pretend you could transfer Bitcoin over the internet, but you didn't have social, I don't think you see the same growth as fast as it is. You know, mm -hmm. like the the, the no proliferation way. of like con content and all the what's that? No way. Yeah, but as you're saying, like it's just part of like the whole thing. It's a double edged sword, which. We should probably give, uh, if we're going to embarrass everybody, you guys can do me, is we're going to, you know, congrats to Marty and getting, uh, we're talking social media, his new um, media brand out that where I was initially thinking about this was you asked, what do you think about like long term? And the fun part is like all these things just need to be built, right? It's not like we're thinking, and maybe we're, we're obviously biased, but we just generally believe like oh, there's a lot of broken stuff and it's not that hard. I mean, it is hard to fix, but it's there. It's like going to the gym. It's like, it's not complex. It's just, you got to do it. And the way that the money's broken and infrastructure is broken is the same way that news and media and the content and the incentive models are broken. And I think Marty's working on fixing that. And so congrats to, to getting truth for the commoner out and then uh, pumped to see where, where it goes. Thank you, sir. No, that was, I was going to piggyback on Mitch comments, Mitch's comments. Uh, I've actually been very relieved that I've been busy getting that launch out uh, over the last two weeks, particularly because it's forced me to focus and not pay attention to, the madness on social media right now but yeah no it's um i think it's i mean michael you and i have talked about this for years tftc has been standing there and there's definitely something that we can do with it to blow it up and really again eat our own dog food and inject bitcoin into it and change the content monetization model using bitcoin and the lightning network and due to our partnership with mash we're really excited for where that can go we've already seen some really cool stuff and really good uh, responses to to what we've done. It's one of those things, like you said, uh, we've been staring at this. Me and you personally have been talking about this for years. It's like, all right, somebody's just got to go build it. It's going to take work. It did take work. We've got it out there now. And people, the response over the last 24 hours has been pretty incredible to see it, uh, especially after the TFTC episode I recorded with Lewis from MASH. Like that got out there and there's people like in the incumbent media industry you are like, oh, I finally get it now. Even though we've been talking about it and writing about it for years, I think we just need to get something out there to show people. Yeah, people discount the value of the idea. It's really the thing in this space. You never experience it if you have it and it's not there. And people, like a couple of people say, you, like, that's a good idea. Why doesn't it exist? It's not, generally it's it's because it's a dumb idea. Like if somebody already done it in, a, in the regular world. But in Bitcoin world, it's just because nobody's done it yet. We're that early. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very cool to see that people are recognizing it. Yeah. Um, we're, we're going to win. It's going to take time. So Slowly but Mitch, surely. I, Mitch, I identify with your, uh, your like measured we're, we're, I think we're going to win. We're on the path to winning. Um, whereas Marty comes in and, and Michael with a extreme confidence that frankly, I find, uh, uh, very encouraging because well, it's too easy for me to think about, focus on how we could possibly not win when in reality, it looks like we're going to win. Mentality hey. is everything. I've, I've coached a couple championship teams and mentality is everything. You literally have to have a winner's mindset. We're going to win. I, I think if Coinbase, I, I, held all the, if Coinbase held all the Bitcoin, I don't know if we'd win. That's why we had to do what we had to do. That was the, <laughs> we got to do something if, if, you, if you spot a hole. That's what I'm focused on. Because I, I, I don't think being digital gold is winning. I think fixing money is winning. And, you know, if we're just a BlackRock ETF and, you know, people are making money because, you know, price goes up and, you know, Bitcoin's, a, you know, an X percentage of, you know, someone's portfolio. I think that's wonderful, but that's not winning. It's, you know, doing the actual work that you know, you've got, you know, recheck your financial freedom or you know, it, doing the work that actually helps, you know, those in, you know, debt reading countries, you know, ours being <laughs> potentially one of them for the future. But like, you know, being in Argentina, hearing those stories, like that's who we like, these people need the exit ramp here. And, you know, if sure net worth's going up is great, but, you know, actually, you know, letting people, giving them a, a you know, an exit valve of, of non-sovereign money, I think that's winning. 
And, and I think that work started, and, but it's it's building the rails now. It's you know companies like OnRap and it's companies in those regions and you know making sure that the you know this market cycle we don't get an FTX, um, making this actually reliable um, where you actually can you know average person, high net worth person have that you know exit valve that you can feel good about. Um, I think that's winning, and that's why, you know, I I see the companies doing the work. It's inspiring. I we need to you know keep nose to the grindstone, keep doing it. Um, but that's that's where the reservations come from. It's like, look, I yeah, I get the you know supply demand, you know the economics of this. This thing's going to a million or you know whatever you know dollar you know forecast you want to put on it. But you know, working is a different definition for me, and I, I do think we get there. We're going to end yeah. it there. We're going to win. We're going to win. We are going to win. Anything you guys want to wrap it up with? You, you know, I'm I'm going to send Mitch an article after this about uh, Bitcoin in the American West because you got me thinking about that. Um, it's all about, you know, the nascent infrastructure slowly being built out and you go from trading posts to to roads to railroads uh, to, to, you know, an integrated highway system. And we're still in the trading post era of, of Bitcoin infrastructure development, but that is how we win. And, you know, I, you know, different jurisdictions in America are certainly fighting against it or, you know, institutions, but I, I do think, you know, at its core ideal wise, you know, I, Bitcoin is American, you know, and I, from an ideals perspective, this does feel like a revolution. You know, the way that you know we read about revolution in the history books, it's it does have a lot of that ethos, um, and I think it's a pretty cool thing to be a part of. Yeah, tied into the uh, Jesse's uh, comment about us being confident. It's like uh, I'm really excited about all the stuff that's happening and. Um, and it's going to be a journey, but it, it was thinking of like, what we're doing is honestly the like most least sexy thing that you can ever imagine during this monetization. <laughs> we're just like figuring out how you fucking store the Bitcoin. And, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it hit me. It's like, think about what's going to happen. And I always anchor back to uh, David Bailey. He, he said actually on Marty's pod years ago, it's an all-time classic too, if you haven't listened to it. But he said, the real party starts when the dollar ends. And it's always stuck in my head because we talk about like Marty and the, the media and like the incentive model and like all the different ways that the incentives and we talked about it last week with Larry and uh, accountability, like that vision of the world is just so incredible. We can't even fathom and like to get to that other side and the way like capital formation happens and businesses and like returns and all in cost of capital, like all those things, we never have gotten to live in that world. And just to be able to see like little glimmers of it and participate, even if you don't see the other side, like there's nothing better I can imagine to be doing because we know, like, we know that it's there. Like we have the, we, we can see the map. Like we just got to like stay alive long enough to, to get to the other part of it. I mean, like, but like bringing it back, like the, for the kids aspect, like imagine living in a world where you're not trying to outpace inflation. You're not trying to, you know, worry about being an asset allocator every day of, you know, sure I'm bringing in my money, but then I got to worry about, you know, how I'm going to, you know, outpace inflation and, you know, make sure my net worth is, you know, growing enough to, you know, support the living standard I want. It sounds like a great world for, for, for the kids that hopefully we're building. Yeah. We got to do it. If not us, then who, if not you, then who out there listening? One, I know you got some ideas. Point. I know you're sitting in that, that cube smashing some functions into Excel. You're about to get replaced by some AI. You need to pick up, <laughs> you need to pick up your, your hammer and get to work in the Bitcoin economy. That is true. Please email us. We uh, have the best people that have reached out cold. So if you're interested, we have a we have a mission, and we're also going to be with BitGo and CoinCover in Vegas hosting a, a few events. So please reach out. Um, you'll find a way to reach out to us if you're interested. We'll get you on the list. Marty, we got a course and to, to go. We still TBD, but hopefully Marty will be there with us. And uh, yeah, I had, I had to do our, our Vegas plug. Better get to Vegas. You get, you, by the time this drops, you get you got three days. So, if you're in Vegas for money 2020, oh yeah, will be there. 
Yeah. The run on the uh, you know Vegas flights post this pod. It's going to be nuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This was fascinating. Let's go record another podcast. We'll be back next week with the last trade. <laughs>